Welcome to the next in the series of lectures for the online course of American Economic History here at Rutgers University. And what we're going to talk about in this installment is uh, the Revolutionary War, in particular a few things related to reasons for it, financing of it, and how the navigation acts and mercantilism impacted colonial trade. So those are our objectives, how the Navigation Act were the embodiment of mercantilist policy. What difficulties the colonies fa faced in financing the Revolutionary War, and we'll take a look at the debate over how much those policies truly impacted the colonies themselves. Uh, let's just go over uh, mercantilism again and a little bit about the colonization that occurred because what we're talking about, what we're going to try to address is how much did those mercantilist policies impact the colonies. So we've got to remember one thing, that the colonists were British subjects. They were British subject to British, British law, British regulations. All right? So let's make sure we have that underpinning that these were British colonies, we were Brit the British subjects at the time. Uh, this worked well, this notion, until the French were basically kicked out of North America by the British. The French and Indian War uh, is where we start to see the hostilities between the colonies and Great Britain start to, to escalate. So the Navigation Act, as you remember, restricted trade with Great Britain and the rest of the world. So the colonies had a specific set of rules that they had to follow. So there's restrictions between Great Britain and the colonies, and there were restrictions between the colonies and the external world. Um, so basically what the Navigation Acts were trying to do was to try and basically give Great Britain a monopoly on trade with the colonies to the, the, to an extent that the largest extent possible is the way to say that. All right. So any trade that was flowing from the colonies or to the colonies, uh, Great Britain was supposed to be the intermediary point. So we were going to see that obviously this would be of some benefit to the ship owners. Anybody who was involved in shipping in Great Britain would see an increase in demand for their products because, for example, if goods were being shipped from the Netherlands to the colonies, they had to be shipped to Great Britain first and then shipped on British ships. So there was a definite benefit to the ship owners and mariners because there's going to be an increase in the demand for their services. And also the benefits uh, for merchants that were uh, loyal to the king. This is a whole notion that the Navigation Acts were to increase gold flows into the country to the benefit of the king. And obviously if you were loyal to the king, you would see an increase in those benefits. So you want to be able to protect the king's income. So customs, fines, confiscations, taxes, etc., were to make sure that the king was getting a larger share of that income as possible, and that the individuals who were loyal to the king would share in those spoils. The colonists, however, there were some benefits from the Navigation Acts, and I want you to realize that, that under the Navigation Acts, I told you previously that if anything were shipped to the colonies or from the colonies, they had to be shipped on British shipping. So basically it gave a monopoly on the shipping trade between the colonies and the external world in Great Britain to the British. While the colonists were considered British subjects, so ships that were built in New England benefited from that. They benefited from the exclusion of uh, foreign shipping from the marketplace. So I want you to realize that even though the Navigation Acts placed some restrictions on trade, with the colonies. These restrictions also had a beneficial effect, particularly to the shippers, built people who were building ships in New England and the shipping industry in New England because they were protected from competition uh, from the exterior world by the Navigation Acts. This restriction on British shipping because the colonies were part of Great Britain, so ships and shipping interests in the colonies had some level of protection. All right, 
So we already discussed this, that the items had to be shipped on British ships with a British captain and with a crew that was three-fourths British. So you can see this, that we're trying, to, the Navigation Acts and Mercantilism in particular, basically is giving a monopoly to British shipping and international trade here. You had to be on a British ship, the captain had to be British, and at least three-fourths of the crew were uh, British. Same thing held for imports from Asia, Africa, and non-British North American colonies. So basically you can see here what the British are trying to do. They're trying to monopolize the sea trade with the colonies by these regulations. All right. Also, only British subjects were allowed to be merchants or factors. Factor is somebody who, I should think the best way to explain it, a factor. If you uh, have international trading interests and you have a trading post in a foreign land, that was referred to as a factor. It's a, an individual who stayed in that foreign land and you had a permanent settlement in that land to help facilitate trade. That was considered a factor. So, for example, under this rule, you wouldn't see Dutch factors or Spanish factors or French factors in the British colonies. You would only see British factors facilitating trade. And we already discussed the implications of this monopoly on intra-English intra port trade. Also realize that there were something called enumerated goods. Commodities exported from the colonies that had to be shipped through England prior to re-export. So not only were they trying to monopolize trade, but there were specific items that the British wanted to make sure went to Great Britain. So not only were they trying to monopolize trade and trying to get all trade flowing through, they enlisted particular goods of specific interest to them. And these items included sugar, tobacco, cotton, and indigo were the main sources of it. So they, these enumerated goods are goods that were specifically listed as part of the Navigation Acts that had to go to Great Britain prior to transshipment to another region. So the enumerated goods are for exports out of the colony. So if you had sugar and you were shipping it to the Netherlands, you had to ship it from uh, the colonies to Great Britain. That had to be transshipped to, to the Netherlands. Same thing for tobacco. These were considered to be highly strategic uh, commodities that necessitated a specific listing. So make sure you remember what an enumerated good is. An enumerated good fell under the Navigation Acts and they just listed out specific goods of interest to the British that they were more uh, interested in in going between the colonies and Great Britain before being shipped anywhere else. All right. Make sure you realize, too, with the Navigation Acts, as it says, Acts, or a number of Acts, and there's amendments that kept being added onto it. So you had some initial enumerated goods, and then in 1662 and 1663, the British added additional enumerated goods. So the list of enumerated goods got expanded over time. And this is where the the issue of requiring transshipment to European of European imports through Britain. So initially, the Navigation Acts didn't require the transshipment of uh, British goods, i.e. you had to ship your goods from the colonies to Great Britain. Initially, you could ship your goods from the colonies straight to the Netherlands. And the British decided that in order to tighten up these Navigation Acts and, and improve the uh, flow of trade through Great Britain, that all goods had to be transshipped. You had to ship them to Great Britain and then to their final uh, port of destination. So one of the things I wanted to do here was to give you a very simple economic analysis, a very simple supply and demand analysis of the impact of the Navigation Acts on colonial exports. I have American exports, but you could say colonial exports. Here we have demand for exports, and here we have the supply of exports in colonial ports. Now, we're just starting with this analysis because I want to illustrate to you what the impact of costs upon that supply curve. All right. So this is not a very unique or very interesting type of analysis because the demand for exports is in the country that is demanding it. So just because we have a supply of exports, let's say, in Philadelphia, the demand for exports in other countries uh, is not important because of the fact that that demand does not exist in the port of Philadelphia. So if we're in this colonial port, the demand for exports 
is in that, the native country. So how we have to adjust for that is we have to add in transportation cost into the supply curve. So what happens to a supply curve when we see an increase in the cost of doing business? The supply curve shifts to the left. All right. So the supply curve shifts to the left or shifts, shifts up in this case here. And the vertical distance between the original so this is the supply of exports and the colonial ports. Here's the supply of exports and the European ports. The difference being the cost of transportation. We have to include the cost of shipping that good, let's say, from Philadelphia to uh, Amsterdam. Let's, let's use that as an example. And those additional costs cause the supply curve to shift to the left or to shift upward here. All right, so that new supply curve is including the cost of shipping that particular item. And we can see here that this gives us what the price of those exports would be. Once we include the cost of transporting that product to Europe, as the supply curve shifts to the left, we can see that this new price is higher than the colonial price. And that vertical distance is exactly equal to the cost of transportation. This distance between here and here is exactly equal to the distance between PC and PE. So this vertical distance in here is exactly equal to the cost of transportation. All right, so let's take a look at that, the welfare implications of that. So this blue area down at the bottom is the producer surplus. It's the area below the price and above the supply curve. So we have this supply curve here, we go in the quantity, and once we hit the price, we go across, and this blue area gives us the producer surplus. Now, the reason why this is the price, you might be confused and saying, well, here's the price in the European markets. Here's the price when we sell it in Europe. But you remember, we're not getting that price. We are getting that price less the cost of transportation. So, for example, if I sell something for $15 per unit in Europe, I have to take into account that it cost me money to ship it to Europe. And if it cost me $5 per unit to ship it to Europe, I take that 15 minus the 5, the cost of transportation, and that gives me the cost that I'm actually receiving. So here's the price in the marketplace, but once I factor in the cost of additional cost of transportation from shipping from Philadelphia to Amsterdam, this is the price I actually receive. So we have the price in the export market minus the cost of transportation gives us the realized price that the colonists get. And that's what we use to determine what the producer surplus is. Now we have to take into account that this is what the producer surplus was for the colonists prior to the implementation of the Navigation Acts. In particular, the provisions that required items be shipped to Great Britain first and then transshipped to uh, their uh, final destination. So this is the producer surplus that exists without transshipment, without having to ship to Great Britain and then being reshipped to its final destination. Now we have to include the fact that there's going to be a cost to transshipment. All right. Before this, I could take my ship and go directly to the Netherlands. Now I have to take my ship and go to Great Britain and then go from Great Britain to Amsterdam. All right. Now, you know, this might I might have to actually take the boat in to port. I have to moor it. I am I'm going to be in have a cost imposed upon me for port facilities, etc. So my costs are going to go up because number 1, I'm going to be at sea longer. So I'm going to have greater cost due to the fact that I'm going to be at sea. Longer, I'm going to have greater cost in the form of the greater risk because the longer I'm at sea, the more likely I'm going to be lost at sea or my ship will sink or I'm going to lose my uh, ship to pirates, etc. Because as piracy existed, you know, piracy still exists today, but back then it was at a much higher level. So we have to take into account that we're going to incur additional costs due to the fact that we have to ship these items to Great Britain and then ship them on to the final port of destination. The increased risk, the increased number of days out, the port, uh, port fees, etc. that I'm going to have to incur. So we're going to see that the supply curve shifts back even further. All right, so this CT, the C sub TS is the 
the cost of transshipment. This is the additional cost imposed upon uh, the shipper and the fact that they have to ship that good to Great Britain before they ship it to their final destination. So we have CT, which is the cost of shipping goods from the colonies to Europe, and then we have the CTS, which is the cost of goods that the cost of shipment of transshipment the fact of the additional days that I'm going to be at sea, the additional risk and the additional mooring and portage fees that I'll incur by the fact that I had to ship my goods to Great Britain before shipping it to the final destination. So we're imposing additional costs by imposing this uh, transshipment requirement. And what does that do? Well, we can see that this was the original price that we were selling the goods for in Europe. This raises the price to PE1. So here's the original price, PE0. This is the export price that we would have observed without the transshipment requirement. And now this is the new price, PE1, which is the price after the transshipment requirement. So what do we end up saying? Well, there's going to be some cost imposed upon the colonists because we can see already by the increase in the price what happened. The amount of exports, quantity of exports, falls because the price of exports is increasing because of the increased cost of transshipment that is required under the Navigation Acts. So let's take a look at the welfare effects here. Here's PE0. That's the price I'm getting in the ports, but what do I have to subtract off? I have to subtract off the cost of transshipment, and I also have to trans uh, subtract off the cost of, of transporting those goods to Europe. So I have the cost of shipment and then I have the cost of transshipment that I have to subtract off. So this is the price that is observed that we get in the European market. If we subtract off all costs, transshipment costs and shipment costs, we receive this is the price that the colonists actually get. This is the price that they get in Europe. We subtract off those transportation costs and transshipment costs, and that gives us uh, the price that is actually received by the colonists. And if we take a look, what we end up seeing is this light blue area is the new producer surplus. So we can see from here that the producers of exports out of the colonies were made worse off. Their producer surplus has declined because of the uh, requirement of shipping goods to Great Britain before they get shipped to uh, their final destination, those other European ports. So you know, we, we've shown with a very simple supply and demand analysis that this did impose a cost upon the colonists, particularly those in involved in the export trade saw their producer surplus decrease. Okay, let us, I want you to understand though that uh, there's a couple of things that uh, I have to state about this analysis. I can't really quantify how much this was. I can say to you that there was a cost imposed upon those exporters that their producer uh, surplus fell because of this transshipment requirement. The thing is, quantifying that is, is quite different, and that's left for a couple of things that we'll talk about in, our, in the rest of this lecture. There are actual economic historians who attempted to quantify this, and we'll go over that. So the purpose of this is just to illustrate to you how these individuals uh, were made worse off. The limitation of this is, we really can't measure how much worse off. So what I'm telling you is there was a burden of the Navigation Act. If you talk about people involved in the export trade, anybody who was involved in the export trade that uh, was exporting to countries outside of Great Britain, they uh, were imposed, the cost was imposed upon them. They were made worse off by this. The thing I want to point out to you is the exact amount of this cost. It is debatable. Now we've shown that what the cost on exports are, there's also going to be a cost imposed upon individuals who had to import goods, right? Because also remember the Navigation Acts required that any goods that came in from the Netherlands or um, Spain, Portugal, France, etc., other North, Northern European countries had to be shipped to the colony, had to be shipped to Great Britain for a first and then to the colonies. So there's an extra cost imposed upon them. So I want you to realize that this, the Navigation Acts placed a burden on exporters, but it also placed a burden on, on importers. Um, so here is the demand in the colonies 
and here's the supply of imports, but this is a supply uh, that's going to the colonies without transshipment. This NTS means no transshipment. So here's the original price that colonists were paying for these imported goods, and this light blue area represents the producer surplus. Producer surplus is the area above price, so here's the price of those imports, and below the demand curve. So the area of this, this triangle right here is the producer surplus that imports from those uh, foreign countries uh, produced, uh, that consumers got when there was no transshipment requirement. Now once the transshipment requirement uh, came into place in the Navigation Act, we're going to see the supply curve shifting to the left because we're going to impose additional costs on those imports. There's going to be additional time that individuals uh, are going to be at sea. So if you're shipping something from Amsterdam to Philadelphia, you have to ship it from Amsterdam to Great Britain and then from Great Britain to Philadelphia. So you have the additional time at sea, the additional risk of being at sea, any additional portage or wharfing fees that's going to be imposed when you're in port in Great Britain that wouldn't have existed. So the supply curve will shift to the left. And again, this is just equivalent to the vertical distance between those two supply curves is going to be the cost of transshipment. Now you notice I, I have a vertical distance here. I don't know exactly what that vertical distance here. I'm just trying to uh, to impress upon you that there was a burden on people who were purchasing those imports. So if you're an ex exporter of goods uh, out to nations outside of Great Britain or you were importing goods from nations outside of Great Britain, there were costs imposed upon you by the Navigation Acts. So this vertical distance is the cost, whatever that number happens to be. So what do we end up saying? That without this transshipment re requirements, the people purchasing those imports faced a lower price than once those transshipment requirements were put in place. So those consumers are going to be worse off. Anytime a consumer pays a higher price for an item, um, they see their consumer surplus decreasing. And the individuals are made worse off also by the fact that what well, here's the quantity that they were originally uh, purchasing without the transshipment requirement and we can see that this falls after that transshipment requirement comes into being. So these consumers are made worse off by two things. The fact that the quantity they consume goes down and the price level goes up. So let's take a look at what the new consumer surplus is. It's this dark blue area here. So we can see that requiring transshipment from that country to England and then to the final destination of the colonies increases cost of those imports. The supply of those imports shift to the left. We see that the quantity of those imports consumed falls and the price level increases which causes consumer surplus to decrease. All right. So I want you to be aware of that, that there were costs imposed upon the colonists. Specifically, if you were an importer or an exporter, you had a higher burden of, of the Navigation Acts. Let's put that together with who were the people uh, who were most affected by that. The people who were most affected by this, if you take a look at it, is... Um, who was the most involved in shipping, importing and exporting? It was New England. So if you understand that a lot of the agitation that was coming from the navigation, uh, for Revolution and Navigation Acts, quite a bit of it was coming from New England. And some people argue that they faced a higher burden because of the fact that their import and export costs were higher because of the Navigation Acts, because of that shipping requirement. Now realize that that's balanced out by the fact that they got benefits from that. Remember I told you previously that they held, they got some benefits from the reduced competition. Because they were involved in shipping, the fact that the Navigation Acts precluded other countries from trading with the colonies, New England had benefits from that. But some people point out that they uh, looked at the negative side of that, that the costs of that they had, um, they were getting, they had to sell high, at higher prices in foreign markets and that they were paying higher prices for imported goods, that they stressed that as a cost that was being imposed upon them um, from Great Britain. 
So just realize that, that there, there is a way to show this economically, that the navigation acts were a burden. Now, in my simplified analysis here, um, we're not trying to come up with exact numbers as to what the, the burden was. Uh, there are author, authors, economic historians out there that have done this, and they have quantified exactly what these losses are, and we'll go over those a little bit later. But I just wanted to give you an example of how you can use some very simple supply and demand analysis to illustrate what the cost was and who was the people who bore the burden of that. So now that we're moving into this revolutionary war phase, I will, one of the things that I'm going to go over a number of times is what can be done to finance a war. And there's going to be five things that you can do in order to finance a war. So whenever we talk about any time the United States is involved in a war, there are things that you can do to finance the war. If you're going to spend war, spend money on a war and, and finance a particular war, if you're going to increase spending, obviously one of the things you can do is decrease spending. So if you're going to increase military expenditures, you can decrease your non-military expenditures. Now, just like if you have a household budget, if you're going to spend more on a car to buy a nicer car, that means you could spend money, less money on other things to balance the budget. So realize that, that if you're trying to finance a war, if you're going to increase your military expenditures, one way you can finance it is to just decrease your non-military expenditures. Another thing that you can do is to tax. You can raise revenues by taxing. Well, I want you to realize that this is probably not going to be viable for the colonies because, as you realize, you know, from studying regular history is the no taxation without representation chant. One of the rationales for the Revolutionary War is that the colonists uh, didn't want to pay taxes because of the fact that they weren't represented. They, they did not, were not, their voices were not heard in Parliament, in the House of Commons, etc. So they were paying taxes that they had no voice in passing or, or, uh, or repealing, etc. So the likelihood of taxes being a viable option to raise money for the Revolutionary War was quite small. All right, number one, you didn't have a central government to tax. You had these colonies who were revolting, and the individual colonies might have um, the ability to tax. But in general, now I always state, you know, that no, what I said previously, no taxation without representation. I think of that as no taxation. I think the colonists, and, and this is my own personal view from the things I've read, that it, regardless if they were represented or not represented, they just didn't want to pay taxes, period. So taxes as a form of revenue was probably not going to be viable. What else can you do? Just like a household, if you want to spend more than you have in money, you can borrow money. If you want to buy a car, you can get a loan. If you want to buy a house, you can get a mortgage. Okay. So you can borrow money. Well, there's difficulties with borrowing money. Think of this from the perspective of the individual lending money. We have a group of colonies fighting a war of independence from the greatest power, military and economic power in the world. If those colonies lose, you will not get your money back. So there's high risk involved with lending money to the colonies because if the colonies win, you lose your money. So the colonies did borrow some money to finance the Revolutionary War. I want you to realize that France, the Netherlands, uh, were two countries that lent us money. They lent us a lot of money. I think they lent us the money mostly just to be a thorn in the side of Great Britain. They made things more difficult for Great Britain in the world and world trade as, as Great Britain was spending money to fight this revolution and had resources tied up. That meant that, meant that the Netherlands and France could make inroads and, and economically, etc., in an empire building in other areas of the world while Great Britain was preoccupied with fighting with the colonists. So yes, the Netherlands and France did lend us money and we did borrow some money, but it, it was nowhere near enough to cover the cost of financing the war. So what we've shown so far is that taxes brought in very little revenues. We did borrow some money. How else can you finance a war? Well, you can just print money. Basically, print money and purchase things with that the money that you're printing. And what we will illustrate to you is this was the main vehicle that the colonies used to finance the Revolutionary War. They printed money, and they printed a lot of money. 
and this is something that we'll go over. We'll look at a table that has the uh, uh, amount of money that was being printed by the colonies, and we'll also take a look at what happens to the value of that money. And the final thing is you could just confiscate resources. All right, this is done in war, you know, World War I, World War II, etc. I give you examples of confiscation. Um, one of the courses I teach here at Rutgers is the economics of beer, and one of the things I talk about in that class is the impact of World War I and World War II on the brewing industry in Europe, particularly in Belgium, and realize, for example, in World War I, that in order to get raw materials, Germany, what they would do is anything that was copper or anything metal related, they would just strip it down and ship it back to Great Britain. So you see a dramatic decrease in the number of breweries in Belgium. Belgium had 3,000 breweries, into over 3,000 breweries in 1900, and by today I think it's around 100. And if you look at the periods of World War I and World War II, particularly in World War I, I think one-third of the breweries in Belgium stopped existing, and a number of those stopped existing because of the fact that they're, that the, the copper, et cetera, were confiscated by the Germans and shipped back to Germany in order to make bullets and, and other items for fighting war. So realize that that's an option. Your, your army can just go through and take stuff. So if your army's hungry, they can take cows, pigs, your wheat, corn, etc. They can take any number of those things. But the main thing that we're going to focus on, and which I want you to be aware of, is Number one, that the limitations of taxation and borrowing pretty much limited the Continental Congress into printing money and printing money in an excessive amount. So here we are, we actually have um, money that was issued by Continental Congress. This money was referred to as the Continental. So here are some numbers that they printed. So in 1775, um, they printed 6 million continentals. In February of 1776, they printed another 4 million. Okay? And you can see that these were at par, which means that uh, the f they had not depreciated in value. You can see very quickly that by May, they issued another 5 million. All right? And the value of these uh, continentals in exchange for specie fell before it was a one-to-one -one ratio. Now you had to give 1.25 continentals for every piece of sterling. Sterling silver, sterling gold. Okay, So this depreciated by about 25%. So very early on, people started losing confidence in the continental. By May, it had already depreciated by about 25%, meaning you needed 25% more of continentals to purchase gold or silver. Uh, in the marketplace. And since we're talking about the mercantilist system and the gold standard, etc., that's where we're going to base depreciation on the continental. And you can see at the end of 1776, by November, December, it had further depreciated. So now it took 1.5 1, 1 continentals to purchase uh, the same amount, the original amount of gold and silver. We get into 1777, and we can see that they keep printing more money. And what do you see? Keeps falling in value. Actually stabilizes in August. I would imagine that if we looked at the military campaigns here, that the colonies were doing pretty good. They might have won a few battles in this time period, and people actually had confidence that they were going to get those Continentals back. But by November and December, what do you end up saying? The Continental has depreciated. Where originally it was a one-to-one -one ratio, now it was four Continentals to get the, equivalent, the initial amount of gold or silver. All right, let's look at 1778, and you can see they keep printing more and more money, and they actually start to accelerate. By September, November, and December, 15 million continentals, 10 million continentals, another 10 million. And you can see by the end of 1778, again, the, pr the value in terms of specie of the continental was cut in half. Before, it was five continentals to get that initial amount of gold and silver, and now you needed twice the amount. So basically, in 1778, you have a 100% inflation rate. So in 1776, your inflation rate's about 50%. All right. In 1777, um, 
the inflation rate if we start from February, it's about 60%. So we have 50%, 60%, 100% inflation rate. And if we take a look at 1779, it's roughly a 300% rate of inflation. You need 17 continentals, and at the end of the year, you need 50 continentals to do that. So that's about a 300% inflation rate. And you can see, you know, what happens during this time period. You see the amount of continentals being produced is greater and greater. Why? Because it's getting smaller and smaller in value relative to uh, species. So you have to print more and more money in order to get that species. So let's take a look at 1780, and what do we see by 1780? Eh, they stopped printing it. Why did they stop printing it? Because nobody wanted it. It's probably the best explanation for this. Okay, 1780, if we take a look, November of 1779, 20 million of these continentals were printed, and then 1780 and 1781, people... They just stopped printing it. Well, what does that tell you? We're not printing any more of this paper. And, but what happens? The value of it keeps getting smaller and smaller. All right. So let's go back. What was it, 50 by the end of November? They stopped printing the money, Continental, and it actually appreciated in value. It went from 50 Continentals to get an equivalent amount of uh, gold or silver down to 40. So it actually improved in value in the beginning of 1780. Why? Because they stopped printing it. Now, people were losing value because like, the, the prevailing notion at the time was they're, keep, they're just printing more and more of this money. It's going to keep going down in value relative to specie. And January and February, you actually see that the value of the continental actually appreciates in value. It actually improves in value. But by March, it continues to uh, depreciate that it appreciates. I would imagine that since there no money was being uh, printed in this time period, that this was a period where the war was going particularly well. The people thought that there's a chance that the colonies will win and that you're going to get a specie in exchange for these continentals. And then the price of this actually appreciates with uh, how well the war is actually going. So a portion of this value has to do with how much money is being printed, but also it's people's perception of are we actually going to get repaid in specie for this and at what amount. And I believe that when, when you start seeing period, I know I've looked at these, for example, greenbacks were used to finance the Civil War in the North, that the fluctuations in the greenback were very much related to uh, how well the war was going. And if the North lost a battle, the greenback went down in value. And if the North won a, a, a particular battle, uh, the, the value of the greenback went up. So I would imagine that this was that this period here where we start to see the prices stabilizing and improving, that the war was going particularly well. And then even though the war's doing well, it looks like the colonies are going to win, it's you can see that this is depreciating even further. People realize that even though the colonies are going to win, there's they don't know have any idea what um, what's go the redemption of specie uh, of the continentals, what's the value actually going to be. So at the beginning of the war, it was a one-to-one -one ratio. So this is the, I'll give you the equivalent. So let's say that continental could buy you one bottle of soda. By the end of the, by the end of the war in 1781, it would take you 147 continentals to buy the same bottle of soda quite a level of inflation, all due to the fact that this money was printed at such high volume. Why did they print money at such high volume? It was, in essence, the only way the colonists could finance the war. There, there were limitations in how much they could tax, whether they could tax it, whether they could actually collect it. They didn't really have a taxation mechanism in place to actually collect those taxes. And two, due to the fact that um, with any time you're uh, financing a revolution. If the revolutionaries lose, you ain't going to get your money back. Do you really think that if we had lost the Revolutionary War, that Great Britain would have said, you know, these people who lent money to these uh, revolutionaries, we'll pay their debts for them. So if the revolutionaries lost and you lent money to them, too bad. So there was high level of risk for individuals to lend money to the colonies because they didn't think they were going to get paid back. 
So realize that that the reason why you know people often say, well, they were uh, unwise in printing money this much money, and they, this is what caused the hyperinflation that occurred with the Continental, uh, which is true. But remember, what other op options did they have? They couldn't really tax or collect that tax money. They really couldn't borrow. So the only other option that was available to them was to print money, and to print money in very large quantities. So finally, what we're going to take a look at is the cost and the benefits of being part of the British Empire. And that's the final thing that we're going to take a look at. And there were some people who argued that being part of the British Empire and being under mercantilism, there was a high level of cost associated uh, with that. So one of the things you have to realize is that you have to look at both ends. If you're going to look at the burdens of being in the British Empire and the burdens of being under the mercantilist system, you have to look at the two components. You have to realize that there were costs, and I showed you what some of the costs were when I did the import-export analysis and the burdens of that. But also, there's all, being part of the British Empire had benefits associated with it. All right. So, for example, you know, how do we estimate this? What would the European demand been in the absence of the Navigation Act? You have to come up with some sets of assumptions. And also, how much was GDP reduced by the fact that these restrictions were in place? So that's the thing that we have to take a look at, that the burden is, the burden would be how much taxes the colonists were being placed upon the colonists, cost of those trade restrictions and that analysis I did, that very simplified analysis could give you an estimate of what that burden was. But then you have to subtract off the subsidies. So there are taxes, the cost of trade restrictions, but then there were subsidies that the colonists got from being within the British Empire. For example, I gave you the notion that the uh, New England shippers benefited. The shipping industry in New England benefited from the Navigation Acts. So we have to take into account that there was a subsidy there. There's also a subsidy due to the fact that Great Britain had the greatest naval fleet and uh, naval, the Navy at the time. So we didn't have to spend as much resources defending the ports and defending ourselves against piracy because those costs were borne by the British Empire. So that's one thing I want you to realize, that when people took a look at this initially, a lot of times, number one, they just stressed the taxes, and they, they stressed the costs of those trade restrictions, but they oftentimes ignored the fact that there were benefits. If you're going to look at the costs and the benefits and just stress the costs, it's going to give you a skewed look. All right, so we want to take a look at the costs, which are the taxes and the cost of trade restrictions, but we also want to include into our analysis any of the benefits or subsidies that the colonies got by being in the British Empire. All right, the hacker thesis, and make sure you're aware of this, because this individual basically said that the reason why we fought the Revolutionary War is because the being part of the British Empire and the costs of the mercantilist system on the colonies was untenable. As a matter of fact, uh, quoting Hacker, was to the Revolutionary War was fought to remove the British economic yoke. I mean, highly pejorative statement, but his thesis is that the Navigation Acts and the mercantilist system put an undue burden upon the colonists, and the main reason why the colonists revolted was because of the high cost of being in the British Empire. All right, so in essence, that we were secondary citizens or, or uh, lower class individuals within the British Empire, that we were vassals of British policies. And the fact that he dismisses freedom as a major component of the Revolutionary War was just rhetoric, that people were just felt that the the burdens of being in the British Empire far outweighed the costs, and the fact that we were talking about uh, no taxation without representation was just a rhetorical statement amongst the colonists. All right, then we have an individual, Harper, who comes along and rebuts a lot of the statements of Beard. So when you think of the Beard thesis, make sure you think that the number one thing is the, the reason why the colonies revolted was because the burdens of being in the British Empire were, were great. And that the colonists got to the point where they felt that the burdens of being 
in the British Empire far outweighed the costs, uh, the benefits of being in the British Empire. Uh, he, his argument is, well, yeah, he agrees, Harper, that they, we did suffer losses in their trade to Britain and Europe. All right. But he also argues that Africa and Caribbean trade was largely unaffected. So basically, talking about all the trade that was going on overstates it because a portion of the colonial trade... Now, remember, the trade with Africa was minimal, so I don't know why Harper puts this in here. Remember when we looked at that one table previously, uh, you know, it was like 0 or 1% of imports and exports went between the colonies in Africa. So in terms of the import-export trade, Africa is not that important. But the Caribbean is much more important. This could account to, of up to one-third of trade. So his argument against uh, Hacker is the fact that, you know, a significant portion of colonial trade went to the Caribbean and that was largely unaffected. Even though the British were trying to control this, it was almost impossible for them. All right. He also talks about that there were policies in place that pl promoted colonial trade. The example I gave you is that the mercantilist system benefited the uh, merchant fleets of New England. All right, the, the building of ships was benefited in New England by mercantilist policy. Shipment and mariner trades of New England benefited from that. So his argument is, well, if we take away that mercantilist system, the New England shipping interests would have been worse off because they would have faced increased competition from the Netherlands and other countries that were excluded from that trade. Harper also talks about the fact that taxes on certain items, particularly sugar, molasses, and rum, particularly that those are items from the Caribbean trade, were routinely evaded. So the notion that, yes, you know, you can place a tax on somebody, but if you don't have a mechanism to effectively enforce that, that tax, there is, the burden of that tax is much less than it would actually be under a, a regime where you can enforce it 100% of the time. Let's take a look at the notion of taxes, the tax burden. And this is an estimate from an individual who uh, did the analysis. I wish I had put the uh, actual numbers here. But this gives a pretty good indication of the burden of taxation. If the index of, the, of personal tax burden is 100 in Great Britain, take a look at the index for Pennsylvania, 4. That tells you there's a tax burden of an average person in Pennsylvania versus Great Britain. If you compare a Pennsylvanian to a person from Great Britain, the person in Great Britain's tax burden was 25 times higher than that of somebody in Pennsylvania. The same thing holds for Maryland and Massachusetts. Look at New York and Virginia. So in terms of tax burden, if you take a look at these colonists in these states, you can see that they paid a small fraction of these of what an individual in Great Britain paid. So this notion that the burden of taxes was, was unbearable in the colonies shows that if you look at that, look at that relative to an individual in Great Britain or regions in Great Britain, you can see that the tax burden for these colonies, these middle colonies in particular, uh, was small compared to Great Britain during that time period. So the notion that the tax burden was, was untenable uh, when you compare that to the tax burden in Great Britain and Ireland, it is significantly smaller amongst those colonies. All right, and this is just giving you a notion of what did the trade, how did the pattern of trade change prior to the Revolutionary War and after the Revolutionary War. And this really gives us an impact of what happens with... Um, uh, the Mer uh, Mercantilist System and the Navigation Acts. So just prior to the outbreak of the Revolutionary War, 58% of trade was with Great Britain and Ireland. And after the war, this fell to 31%. But if we take a look at, for example, Northern Europe and Southern Europe, Okay, if we add Northern Europe into this, this moves probably Northern Europe, much, much of this was because of the transshipment here, 16%. So that brings us up to 47%. What I'm trying to point out to you is the fact that the pattern of trade 
really uh, didn't change that much, did it? If we take a look, what happened in Southern Europe? Pretty much the same, 14%. Here it's 58%, but if you include 31% and the 16% from transshipment that would have occurred previously, it's roughly 47%. I'm saying that this 16% would have been shipped to Great Britain and Ireland and then shipped to Northern Europe. So what I want you to realize is that if we take a look at, here's when the Navigation Acts and Mercantilism were in place, and here's when the Navigation Acts and Mercantilism weren't in place, that the pattern of trade, it does change, but it doesn't change that dramatically. So if we take that into account, the Mercantilist system, some people argue, did not warp trade that much. Uh, it did have its cost to the colonists, but if we look at it as something that was a complete disruption of colonial trade, taking a look at a table like this shows you that the pattern of trade prior to the Revolutionary War and after the Revolutionary War were in essence very much the same. You don't see a dramatic change in the, the level of trade that, that occurred. So this gives you an indication that yes, that the mercantilist system and the Navigation Acts did impact colonial trade. But the thing I want you to take away from this, it wasn't as great of an impact as hacker uh, states. Uh, that's it for this lecture. Stay tuned and we will have the uh, next lecture coming up shortly.